team is um, I'm interested in um, integration of techniques that preserve some of the natural controls that are already within the system and finding ways to encourage those to promote those natural controls and to also mitigate against uh, harmful effects to any of those. And by doing that, potentially, um, control in and of itself will lead to reduction um, in the use of certain chemistries that, um, that uh, Dr. Taves talked about um, and other uh, mediation for pest control. So one of my, um, so the big slide here, which is the take home, is that in the grand scheme of things, insects are one of the most diverse animals on the planet. And if you take account of these uh, insects, for every one uh, pest uh, species that we find out there, there's at least a thousand more that are either beneficial or we have no clue what they're actually doing out there. So <coughs> my doors are my doors are open right now, and I urge you if you you know if you're out in your fields um, and you uh, see something that you haven't seen before, especially in terms of insects um, and predators or whatever, please bang on my door. Uh, the, the we have. Uh, you know, weather changes that are, that are pretty amazing at times. Some years we're going to see some things, some things we're going to see others. And so uh, monitoring those things are definitely of interest to me. So please come and visit me um, anytime. So we catch uh, new types of insects that are in the environment um, and we can begin to understand potentially their function because we don't know. In this uh, general thing that uh, these insects are diverse and most of them are beneficial, what are these benefits that they, that they have? Well, they support wildlife. Pollination has been a, a very important one in the landscape. There are major components of human diets uh, in some areas of the world. Um, they return nutrients to the soil and they help in, uh, in moving nutrients and availability of nutrients to plants. Um, and they regulate pest populations. And some of them, although I won't present data on this today, are also part of um, a, a huge group of uh, insects that eat seeds and weed seeds and contribute to that aspect of biocontrol. So then the question is, well, what kinds of things help support these um, benefits? And some of the, the patterns, the general patterns is, is that greater insect diversity usually provides greater uh, levels of services. One of them is pollination. Um, if we take a, if we take a, uh, you had a uh, I'm not isolated over there. Um, if we uh, take a, a sample of the amount of semi-natural habitat, that is hab habitats that are um, grassland or um, forests or hedgerows, the amount of that in the landscape in our agricultural fields, and we look at the amount of bees in, in, in those landscapes, we see a significant more bees in those areas, and that also corresponds with diversity. So pollinators and pollination are definitely related to preserving some natural habitat. Similarly for biocontrol, this is an index that shows the diversity of different components in a landscape, those same things such as forests and things like that. Um, the greater diversity of those components across a landscape tend to lead to greater levels of biocontrol and therefore uh, greater yields. So the general pattern is that when we have uh, quite diverse um, farmscapes and landscapes, this leads to very high levels of uh, natural enemies that can uh, provide these services, also pollinators, and that the simpler we get, the fewer uh, number of these and the fewer diversity of these we have that can actually provide these services um, within our system. So you might be saying, that's all well and good, you know, these landscape diversity things matter, you know, there's more beneficials, and my question to that as well when I read this is, well, so what? I mean, I, I can't go out there, uh, we can't go out there individually and change a whole landscape. So the question becomes, so, so what can we do? And that gets to our research, which is that we can calibrate the use of on-farm technologies that boost up um, the diversity of our natural controls and pollinators that we need in our system um, to complement uh, the chemistries and, uh, and the irrigation that is used to manage other aspects of the system. And that's, that's partly my role. So to begin studying this uh, in my first year here at um, uh, University of Georgia, uh, we looked at a system and uh, one way that you can, you can go about managing this is through uh, the types of tillage that's used and then the types of uh, cover cropping that's used. So, by using reduced tillage, some of the patterns that we've seen so far, 
is that you can incre uh, you can decrease uh, disease, erosion, nutrient loss, um, uh, weed pressure, and disturbance because by having a, a cover crop in place, these hold the soil. They're going to um, provide uh, cover and things on the soil, and so some of these things are, are reduced. The question that, that we're focused on here, and I'll present a little data on, is um, how does cover cropping influence natural enemies um, and biocontrol? And I also have a little bit of uh, uh, stink bug data and yield data to go along with this. So we created a system. Uh, if you look out here, so here's our, here's our treatments. This is at Lang Rigdon. And some of you might have actually visited these plots um, when you came for the field days. But we set up a, a plot system where we have a conventional uh, tillage. We have a uh, grass, which would act as um, border. A um, couple different uh, types of grasses um, involved in another experiment. We have a, a, a clover, uh, and we have um, a rye. So the rye is a, a, a typical one um, uh, that is used here. And then it gets knocked down to form these nice um, uh, beds that could be could house lots of natural enemies and also uh, prevent weeds. The clover, we had two different types of clover. Uh, one of them was a crimson clover that was then uh, burnt down and allowed those nutrients to become part of the soil. And we also had, a, which this year, just a comment on this, this year, we last year we had kind of uh, variable establishment of, of that clover, so it'll be interesting to see if we can get better establishment and whether that influences some of our results. Um, you can see here, here's another plot of that, uh, of that clover there. So variably established within the, within the plot. Um, <clears throat> we also had uh, white clover, which established uh, quite well, and I don't have a picture later in the season, but this technique is also used in corn. And you can get very nice stands of uh, white clover growing throughout the season uh, uh, within corn. So what are we interested in in terms of the natural enemies uh, in response to these treatments? Well, the ones that um, are frequently uh, present here of interest, you all know these gnarly um, uh, fire ants uh, that uh, when you step in their mounds, they're very unpleasant and have a number of different um, effects. You also see uh, uh, coccinellids, uh, these geocaris um, that have uh, sucking mouth parts where they stick their mouth part in and they <coughs> suck down uh, prey. And there are also uh, these spiders, these link spiders. So these are some of the groups that we would be um, looking for when we're out there um, uh, looking for predators. The focus for um, pests uh, were the green, southern green stink bug, uh, in addition to aphids and, and thrips. However, we saw very low levels of all of these um, uh, this particular year in these plots, but I'll present the data that we do have. So our objectives then are to get an idea of, um, determine what cover cropping um, and border grasses have on natural enemy populations and evaluate the effectiveness for promoting um, egg predation. So to get an idea of natural enemies, there's a, a, a few different techniques. Um, one of them is to get an idea of the ones that are occurring on the ground um, that uh, run around and come into the plots. And to do that, we uh, create a pit ball trap. And this is basically a little, uh, a little uh, Dixie cup. And then we place a, um, a, a rain barrier over the top so it doesn't fill uh, with water. Any insect traveling over the surface or spider then falls into there and gets captured and we can count them. Um, we deployed these uh, from April until October to monitor over the season. Um, and overall, we counted this year um, in all of the plots combined, uh, 41,000 um, insects across those. This looks like then this. So most of those were, 45% of those insects captured were fire ants, as you might imagine. Um, from there, we have a group that is quite important for uh, seed predation and predation on other um, insects of interest uh, in there called the carabid beetles that run around on the ground. And we also had uh, spiders. However, this is not the spider. This is just a nice showy one. This one would be up in the canopy. Um, but we have spiders that are in there and a, and a various number of other um, others as well. So how does this look in regards to cover cropping? Well. This graph has a lot of information in it, but if you look across the, the bottom here, these are the different cover cropping uh, treatments. So we have the grasses that didn't have any cotton in them. Then we have um, the four uh, types of cover cropping, either a conventional that received tillage, uh, the crimson <coughs> clover where we burnt down the uh, 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 clover, and we have the rye which was burnt down and then rolled to form a mat on the surface. 
and we have white clover which represents our living mulch throughout the season. Each of the different colors then separates the different groups and the height of the bar represents the, um, the amount of the population that that group um, was part of. So if you watch the red here, the red in the, um, in the two grasses, the fire ants were definitely the highest across here, however, quite similar to crimson clover. Um, and the fire ants were lowest in the conventional. Um, fire ants were a little bit higher um, here in the two uh, clovers. And then you can see a diversity of these um, other ones. The, the take home here is that there were very high populations of these combined natural enemy groups that are running around on the ground and the grasses and the two clovers represent the, the highest number of recruitment of natural enemies into these, um, into these plots. Now, the other portion of this community that we would be interested in are the ones that are actually occurring up in the cotton. And so to do that, uh, we have to go out, and you can kind of see this here. Uh, this is uh, Melissa um, Thompson, who's the um, uh, technician in the lab, and she's actually here. This is her and, uh, and a former student. And if you can see this yellow uh, kind of cloth here, we fold the cloth over the cotton so we can beat it and allow insects to fall into there, and then we collect all the insects out. So these are, this is a beat sheet sample at a point estimate in time. So we, so unlike the pitfall traps, we just go out and we collect them at one period in a very quick sort of like marathon of collecting insects. And this looks like this. Most of the predators that we found up in the canopy were spiders, uh, followed by geocaris, uh, which is a small little one that preys on um, a lot of different things from thrips to white flies to aphids, um, and then various um, others. In terms of the effect of our different um, our different cover crops, it was fairly uh, even in terms of the overall abundance and there's no real pattern in terms of the way in which cover crops uh, change these different uh, communities of the natural enemies. And in this one we found many fewer, um, but still 1,700 uh, uh, predators across uh, time we found. The last thing we did is, um, to get an idea of biocontrol is, um, uh, you can get an idea of how these stink bugs are being affected by, um, uh, by predators by collecting a whole bunch of eggs in the laboratory. So you create a huge colony of, uh, of the stink bugs. We collect their eggs. We take their eggs and, and we affix them to a piece of vegetation. And then we go back there at a later date and collect them and count how many eggs are missing. So they call these sentinel trials. And I know that this isn't cotton. I couldn't find my cotton picture. This is a former study I did in wheat where I, had, I was actually looking at uh, coccinella, um, ladybird beetle predation, but it, just to show you an example of, of what that looks like. So we were, uh, we've deployed uh, 451 egg masses out into um, our system for a total of 22,000 eggs, and we did this um, over a number of periods. Overall, we found that egg predation is about 22% of all those eggs um, that were put out there were predated by predators that, that I just mentioned in the system. And it looks a little something like this. So on the x-axis here, we have the different dates where we deployed these. And then each of the bars then represent uh, the different uh, uh, treatments of, of cover with cotton or, or just the grasses. The main take home, uh, two main take homes from this is in terms of uh, egg predation, these border habitats here represented by the black and the gray are the grasses. And across all time periods, these are the areas where the stink bugs had the highest level of predation, uh, which indicates that those grassy um, kind of borders that are a little bit unmowed are vulnerable areas uh, for stink bugs. If they go into that grassy area and, and they lay their eggs, they will have a high probability of getting predated. Almost 80% of those eggs would be um, annihilated before they could move back into the cotton. The other take home message is this purple uh, bar here and, and blue bar here, and those represent both of the clover trees <coughs> and egg predation consistently across time was the highest in those two um, cover treatments. <coughs> so again, the question we might ask now is, all right, Jason, that's all good, these cover crops and insect stuff is interesting, but what about actual uh, damage to cotton, and then what about actual yield? So I'll present some uh, preliminary uh, work from this year um, on that, and then we'll talk a little bit about those trade-offs. So 
we had overall really low pest levels. Um, if you look here, this is the this is one example being the stink bugs, and this is the average number uh, that we found uh, when we did our samples across the whole season. Um, they were quite variable in re in uh, in relation to the um, in relation to the cover crops, and uh, but the trend is we're higher in the conventional and rye. So each of the the conventional here is in black. Um, and the rye is in uh, is in this one here. So, <clears throat> sorry, yeah, right. Uh, the conventional here. So at the end of the season, here they're very high, and actually ended up being quite high in the uh, crimson in this case too. So variable. These are not significant. These error bars here show the amount of variation around this estimate of populations. These green stink bugs, even though they're very um, obvious in terms of their green, are difficult to find. They're elusive. They're hiding within the plants, and, and they're difficult to find when you go out and do, um, uh, do your samples. <coughs> so how does this relate then to bowl damage? So bowl damage was not related to cover, so we can see that here in this diagram. If we look at the average number of stink bugs and relate that to the number of bowls damaged, the, uh, the different cover crops are represented by these uh, colors here. So the uh, black one is conventional tillage, the gray is the crimson, so on and so forth. And then this line here represents the correlation uh, between the number of stink bugs and bowl damage. There's a positive correlation, and that is if you, if you see more stink bugs in the field, you get higher damage on bowls, which is pretty, um, a pretty intuitive result. <clears throat> Unfortunately, this time, no real relation to using different cover crops for that. So the last uh, uh, thing of interest is how does this then relate to um, the actual yield? And, uh, the yields were pretty similar across each of the cover crops. So we have conventional, crimson, and rye here. They were the lowest for, um, the, for the white clover. So again, although we had the highest number of insects, so um, cover cropping greatly affected our abundance and distribution of these um, natural enemies and predation rate. However, there appear to be trade-offs at this time in terms of how these um, have positive effects on our, our natural enemies and then those corresponding biocontrol services and the actual yield that we get. Um, an interesting one here is that those fire ants definitely remain very abundant um, and were found at very high levels across all of those treatments. So in terms of any mitigation for fire ants, these particular uh, cover crops at this time do not show us in helping that. But there is evidence that they are one of the key predators for the uh, stink bug eggs. They will just eat the whole card that I put out there that have the stink bugs on them, and there's nothing left. And that's evidence that it was fire ants that just destroyed our egg masses. Um, <clears throat> kind of the, uh, the closing, why is this important? Um, integration of these different cover croppings within a system of pesticide and um, other mitigation is important for boosting uh, different controls. Now in this study here, we use no uh, insecticides throughout the whole season. None across the whole season. We still have very low levels of distinct bugs. Um, uh, preserving wild habitats can uh, increase uh, these, uh, the, the controls and natural enemies in the system. And I just want to just point out um, a few things from a part of my other program, and that is I'm working with um, the USDA on uh, border habitats and, and how to promote those in an effective ways, and we're a ways off from a, of a design. But down in Atapogos, we've established some border habitat plots uh, that have uh, a flowering border adjacent to cotton, looking to see how having a border habitat that has uh, these uh, different plants in it may influence the natural enemies and, and promote pollinators in our total landscape. So one, here's another example from the side. This would be a little small plot, the cotton on that side. And then the types of insects you might find in there is this really nice little um, uh, bee here. So with that, I'll just again thank um, the University of Georgia for uh, bringing me here, support from the Cotton Commission, a whole bunch of people um, that helped on this project. And the graduate student that was appointed to this, um, Marissa Verdi, she presented a small portion of these data um, at the, uh, our big <coughs> meeting for the Entomological Society and won the President's Prize for her uh, cotton work uh, this year. So with that, I'll just say thank you and um, any questions.